Uh, we're all still talking about those drone attacks in Israel on Saturday night. World leaders now calling for calm after Israel vowed revenge against Iran. Uh, the U.S. has told Israel it won't participate in any retaliatory strikes. On Saturday night, around 300 missiles were dispatched by Iran, 99 percent of which Israel says were brought down before entering the country. OK. Uh, the Prime Minister here, Rishi Sunak, uh, yesterday confirmed Britain's involvement in uh, shooting down many of those missiles, is what he had to say. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. Well, joining us now in the studio to discuss this and much more, the implications of all of this, Defence Editor of the Evening Standard, Robert Fox. Robert, um, people say, I mean, and you can take all of this with a pinch of salt, 99% of these drones were, were, were shot down. Were they? Did any hit targets? I think about eight or nine did, maybe up to a dozen at most. They were a very mixed bag. Uh, there were drones, there were cruise missiles, which travel very slowly, and one or two um, uh, strategic uh, missiles, quite serious stuff. It all looks a bit orchestrated to me that uh, everybody knew it was going to happen, even the US commander who had flown in to help Israel direct uh, against a possible attack, which they knew was coming from Iran, left almost hours before it happened, pretty confident that things were going to be all right. And uh, Iran has got thousands of these things mm. left still. Everybody is looking around and drawing lessons from it. Israel will certainly strike back, but being Israel, I think they won't strike back in a very obvious way. And I would think targeted assassination rather than a big ground attack. That's interesting. I suppose the comments from President Biden overnight that take this as a win, the fact that they intercepted so many of these missiles, I mean, they haven't necessarily gone down that well in Israel, those comments. But do you think that, you know, in that war cabinet room, they'll be saying, let's bide our time, let's be careful with Iran. This is not the same as Hamas in terms of an enemy. What has happened is that it's actually got the Prime Minister been Netanyahu out of a lot of the problems that he was facing. It was alleged that he was facing a divided cabinet, as well as people in the Knesset uh, ramping up opposition to him, demonstrations. Now, one of the critics, former chief of staff, Benny Gantz, leader of the opposition, but in the war cabinet, absolutely solid uh, with Netanyahu, had been talking about elections later this year. I think that that's off. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu now obviously must feel that he can do what he likes in, in Gaza. And that, that is going to be the problem now. Rafa, the refugee uh, situation. Yes, it, he's got a lot of cards in his hands again. America now has to face the problem of rearming Israel. They did fire away a lot of stuff. I don't want to be too nerdy about this, but if you go into Iron Dome, it isn't just Iron Dome. There's a thing called Arrow 3. A lot of it is joint American-Israeli technology, and the development of the Iron Dome defense system is really being done as much in America as it's being done in Israel. So there's going to be a big bill there. But curiously, it's a bill that Congress can unite around, and it can't unite around re rearming or resupplying, restocking, desperately needed, mm. Ukraine. Mm. Right. Why is Iran involved in this? What, who's irked Iran and how has Israel irked Iran so much? Well, it's always been there because the Ayatollahs from the beginning, 1979, is that, you know, that they are against the Zionist uh, state and they, want, uh, and they want to get rid of it. That is the point of support for Hamas. They've helped them, they've trained them, but they're not buddy-buddy. You have to be very careful about this. And not enough of the, of the differences have been emphasized. Um, Hamas is Arab. Hamas is Sunni. Iran is predominantly Persian and Azeri and Shia. And there are lots of dogs that didn't bark mm. in this one because although they got involved minimally, emphasis minimally, Hezbollah, allegedly the proxy, and it can be a pretty reluctant proxy at times, of uh, Iran, hasn't done that much. Didn't go for a big assault, didn't go for a big attack on the northern cities. I mean, we hear about, we saw the Iron Dome firing over Tel Aviv and uh, uh, Jerusalem. 
Was there an attack on the really big port, the number three city, Haifa? I don't think we've heard too much of the action. If there was, it was easily uh, batted away. There's a lot of sucking of teeth. There's a bit of finger wagging. Don't do anything crazy like attacking into Iran. Not that I, I think that they would. They would attack some bases. And I think that, you know, what we actually saw in the Damascus mm-hmm. consulate on April the 1st, I want to that ask, kind of I want thing to ask we're going to see again. Britain's involvement in this. You see yeah. the Prime Minister coming on and talking about nothing, basically. We can't confirm we've shot down a number. We can give us figures. They'll know exactly how many they, they, they shot down, if any. Um, but we've got the Shadow Defence Secretary uh, coming on the programme in about an hour's time. And, you know, Labour will talk about an increased budget for the... Uh, Defence Department here in the UK and our defence spending. What do we now need to do? We're being caught up in a number of conflicts, uh, supplying equipment, supplying backup, whatever. What are we going to have to do as regards defence spending? Well, we saw what was going on the fireworks display over Tel Aviv and, uh, uh, and Jerusalem. We've got nothing like it. Look. It's up to you, I'm doing your job for you, Eamon. What you asked John Healy, it's not only thinking about defence, which they realise we've got to because the cupboard is very bare and we've got all kinds of exotic uh, coming over the horizon threats. Cyber, particularly space, which is satellites, uh, supply lines, that's what the Red Sea has given. But what I think is so worrying for me, and I can say that my age, um, is that it's they need to think about how they think about defence. Mm. It's not tanks and guns. We're not going to have a big army of 150,000 again. Actually, we don't need yeah. one. And that's the, that kind of innovative thinking that really has to be encouraged. Because the kind of stuff that we saw o- over Israel, it'll all be out of date within yeah. two years. You're going to need to renovate defence systems, be flexible, to be see the enemy for what it is. And it's not going to come in very obvious yeah. forms at time. And it won't come from enemy states necessarily. They will be malign actors, but there are lots well, of others out there. Up the spending. Well, That's right. And I just wanted to ask you on that. I mean, there'll be people listening and watching this, this morning. You'll have someone in Sheffield, someone in Exeter going, right, what I hear Robert Fox this morning saying is this going to cost me a lot of money, what's happening, and this is an escalation in the Middle East. Are there any other implications for us in this country? I mean, if you look at the papers, some of them saying we're on the brink of world War three. You know, how worried should people be this Monday morning? Well, I think that, 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 that that's a bit of lame thinking again, if you say World War three, because it, it, we are in a global contest of that. There is no doubt about it. And you have to see, you know, who's acting, who's not, who's really watching and who's not speaking. Sorry, that's not bloody, bloody, blah. What is China doing in, in all this? Absolutely critical to the whole Iran, Middle East, They've Gulf for story. Calm. You know, that they've called for calm because um, uh, the Iranians, before all this, seized a ship in the Straits of Hormuz. And who relies almost more than anybody else on gas and energy coming out of the, and oil, coming out of the Straits of Hormuz, that is from the Gulf, China. And this is where the moving parts are very important. How Britain operates, how it's going to think about it, I'm afraid to say on capital equipment... Uh, they will probably have to borrow on that because I think there are one, the, 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 there's a, the, all sorts of problems with the defence budget. By the way, the defence budget isn't as fancy as it looks. We blo- go blah, 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 2.1, 2.3% of GDP. Well, a lot of that goes on pensions, welfare. Uh, it's just about allowed under the rules, but it doesn't mean to say we're spending 2% of, of GDP on, mm, on defence. It, but it's innovation thinking, but also with the social offer, it's getting people... People in. We're not getting the recruits at the moment. Young people are not joining to the degree that we need. All three armed services are losing more than they're recruiting each year. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're watching or listening at yeah. home, uh, maybe you are ex-forces um, yourself. Um, why is that? Why are the defence services not attractive at all? I mean, I think I know the answer to that because you get killed, basically. But um, uh, are they paying... It's a 0.1% risk, Amy. It's a, it's a what? <laughs> I think it's about a 0.1% risk. Yeah. Mm. But it, it is a risk, and that's in the contract. Yes. You're dead right. Yeah.